The first reading for this third Sunday of Easter is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning with the 14th verse. We read, Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with the 17th verse. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people, impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish, He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Though you have come to trust in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now on that same day, when Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene, Two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be crucified, condemned to death, and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. 
They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who, of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then, then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while, <clears throat> while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you, sisters and brothers, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In some ways, it's hard to remember that Easter was just three Sundays ago. For many of us, it seems like a distant memory. As we move on to our other spring activities, like softball and baseball games for our kids or grandkids, finishing the school year, maybe planting our gardens. By now, we've made it through all of the Easter ham leftovers. Our company has gone home, and we've taken the Easter decorations down. There's still a few Easter lilies left, however. So our lives have uh, gone back to normal, whatever that is, and the resurrection seems like something we talked about on, Sunday, on Easter Sunday morning, and now we're back to our regular programming. And that seems both sad and normal. What seems stranger to us is the ancient Christian practice of celebrating Eastertide for 50 days, from Easter Sunday all the way to Pentecost, which which I believe is on May 21st this year. 50 days seems like a long time to keep the party going. Why, that's even longer than Advent or Lent. And yet, the Christian calendar may be on to something. Sometimes we practically miss Easter, or we only catch a glimpse of it before it's gone. I don't know about you, but... I need more time to digest what happened at Easter, more time for it to sink in. We're not the only ones. For most of the disciples, Easter barely happened. No human beings alive at that time actually witnessed Jesus' resurrection. And there are only seven stories of Jesus appearing to his disciples afterwards in all four of the Gospels. So while the crucifixion seems painfully real, the resurrection takes on more of a dreamlike, hazy quality in Scripture. 
we catch glimpses of Jesus as he shows up and then disappears. And most of the people who encounter him aren't quite sure who they are talking to, at least not at first. In John's Gospel, and even more so in Luke, which we read from today, the people who meet Jesus after the resurrection have an incredibly hard time recognizing him. Why do you suppose that is? Mary at the tomb talks with him but mistakes him for a gardener. Thomas hears about him third hand but finds the stories impossible to trust. And the two followers of Jesus that we meet on the road to Emmaus today have a long conversation with the risen Lord, even inviting him to stop with them for dinner. Yet they don't seem to have any idea as to who they're talking to. We meet Cleopas and his companion today in our gospel as they are walking the seven-mile stretch from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus. Now, archaeologists are not quite sure where Emmaus was located, but the geography is probably beside the point. Because even if we have never visited the town, we all certainly have walked down that road. This is the road of disappointment and broken dreams. This is the road of regret and questions and uncertain futures. This is what the two disciples must have been feeling that day. Cleopas and his companion talk animatedly with each other. Could it really have only been a week since they stood with the crowds along the Jerusalem streets, waving palms and shouting hosannas? That day it seemed like finally the whole world was beginning to recognize what these disciples had already known to be true. Jesus was the one true king, the one prophesied to save Israel. But instead, only a few days later, they watched from their hiding places as Jesus was nailed to a cross, executed by Roman soldiers at a site close to the city dump. What kind of a king was that? They must have been wrong. This couldn't be the promised Messiah. He had been an inspiring teacher, an insightful teacher, a prophet who worked miracles, and even a friend to them. But they must have been mistaken. And as they walked and talked together, a stranger quietly appeared beside them. Clearly eavesdropping, he finally asks what Cleopas and his friend about what they are discussing so intensely. Looking a bit shocked that the stranger wasn't familiar with all that had happened the past week, they tell the stranger the story about Jesus and all that had taken place. They shared their hope that Jesus would be the one to save them, the Messiah long promised from ancient, ancient times. They also shared that their hopes had been crush, crushed with Jesus' crucifixion. Their pain and grief over Jesus' fate must have been raw and very apparent. They wondered aloud to the stranger. Yes, they'd heard the rumors that Jesus' tomb had been found empty that morning, but they hadn't seen it for themselves, and they only had the testimony of a woman. And even in court, a, a woman's testimony at that time was not considered to be reliable. Perhaps all of this, they thought, was just a confusing tale. But then, the stranger does a remarkable thing. He tells the story of Jesus back to Cleopas and his companion. But this time, the story starts at the very beginning of Scripture and continues through the prophets and Israel's history. As they listened 
to the stranger's words, the disciples begin to feel a spark being kindled in their hearts. It starts to warm them all the way through, tingling down to their fingertips and setting their hearts ablaze. This is something they hadn't felt in a long time. Something like hope. Something like joy. They don't want to let go of this feeling, so as they draw near to their destination, the two companions invite the stranger to come and eat with them. But when he sits down at the table, all of a sudden, the stranger becomes the host. He picks up the bread as if he had made it himself. He blesses it and begins to share it as if this was his table and his meal. And as they reach out to receive the bread, Cleopas and his companion finally see the stranger for who he is, their risen savior. And my question for today is, Do we recognize Jesus in the words that we hear from Scripture and in the bread and wine that we share every week around this table? Do we understand and appreciate the gift of Jesus' own self as we come to Holy Communion, whether it's at the rail, around the altar, or by intinction, or in the tiny wafers and sips of wine in our pews or at home when we can't physically come to church. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. One of my greatest joys as a pastor is to offer communion to our congregation or even to an individual. This past week or 10 days, Steve Moyer and I have taken communion to several individuals and families of Emmanuel. One of my greatest regrets of the past four months is that I was not able to take communion to Don Neely before he passed away on April 14th. And yet, we know that he is now feasting at the heavenly banquet table with Jesus and those who have fallen asleep in the Lord. Like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, my sorrow at Don's death is mixed with the joy of knowing that Don is now experiencing resurrection life himself. We're reminded in today's scripture that after the resurrection, the disciples' relationship with Jesus changed. He wasn't as easily recognized. Perhaps he wasn't as easily found. But the things that made him recognizable to them were the things that had always been true about who Jesus was. The opening of scripture, the breaking of bread, the hospitality shown to the stranger, and the calling of his disciples by name. Mary, Simon Peter, Thomas. And I have to wonder, maybe this is how Jesus usually shows up. Even today in the midst of our ordinary lives, when we are working in our gardens or walking down the street, doing our homework, fixing supper, In the faces of the friends or strangers or classmates we meet along the way. When we read the Bible and discuss it together, when we share a meal together, when we invite someone to join us in fellowship, that's where Jesus shows up. After all, Easter doesn't happen on just one Sunday and then disappear. And Jesus wasn't just alive 2,000 years ago and then gone without our hearing from him ever since. Resurrection happens every day. Jesus lives in our hearts and in our spirits. 
We see resurrection in relationships that break and then are mended again. We see it in the new life that blooms in the spring and in the repair of creation in prairie restorations and wildlife habitats. We feel it in hopes that seem to shatter but then are slowly reborn. We witness it in lives that fall apart but are later put back together piece by piece. And we also experience it every time we listen to our Sunday readings and receive Christ's body and blood. If we want to make, if we want to experience Jesus and if we want to make our Easter celebration last, we don't need to position ourselves in exactly the right place at the right time. We simply need to pay attention for the risen Lord is among us, moving and speaking and working here and now through the power of the Holy Spirit. Even when we don't sense Jesus' presence, he is walking beside us, meeting us on whatever road we are on. The tomb was not the end of the story. Death did not have the last word. The promise of God's presence and power and hope is ours to receive and carry with us for the rest of our lives. Jesus sets our hearts on fire within us with hope that we may have thought we'd lost forever. And all of a sudden we realize Jesus has been with us all along and we are filled with joy. In the name of our resurrected Savior, Amen.